day the Lord has made and we can rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you this morning to the Owensboro Cumberland Presbyterian Church as we celebrate this Easter morning at the risen Christ. Before we begin, if you have not yet printed your serving notes, uh, please take time to do that. You can find them on this Facebook page. Uh, for those who are on our email uh, list, you may find them in your inbox. Also, uh, a very special part of our worship service this morning will be our virtual communion. And so for those who have yet to prepare your elements, uh, I ask you to take time uh, before we begin this worship service, prepare elements for all who are in your home so that we all may participate <coughs> and commune as one, one with the Father and one with each other. Will you join me in our invocation prayer? Father, on this Easter Sunday celebration, we just bow our hearts before you in praise and adoration, thanking you for the cross, the price you willingly paid. But even more so, Father, we thank you for the Easter truth. The grave could not hold you. Behold, you are alive forevermore. Father, in this moment, draw us to you that we may see and experience the reality of Easter new and afresh. Most of all, Father, if there be one who would hear this worship service today, they would be drawn to your grace, mercy, and love. Father, we pray that this would be the day of salvation and that another Easter victory would be won. In the name of Jesus, the risen Savior, we do pray. <coughs> amen and amen. This morning, we have all kinds of things that are thrown our way in this world. And sometimes they're, we can't conquer them. We, we know what we're going through right now, and all the science in the world can't solve the problems that we're having today. But you know, we serve a risen Savior, and He has it all under control. And the greatest thing that we have in our favor is that He died on the cross to save us from our sins. We hope today that you have Him living in your heart so that when your day comes to pass from this earth, you can go live with Him forever. How do we know that he lives? Because he lives in our hearts. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. It's different for us too. But we're going to have a congregational song. I hear people in church every week say, Oh, I don't want people to hear me sing. Uh, so they don't sing out loud. Well, you're at home now. You can sing out loud and it's not going to bother anybody. So we hope that you will lift your voices. Make the sound come all the way here on Booth Avenue where we can hear you. Sing out on his favorite Easter song, He Lives. I, I, you ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. So build it out so that we can hear and let's worship together. <laughs> Hey! 
favor game. You know, you try to ring the, you try to, somebody throws the rings on the ears and everybody always wants to wear the hat, not really. The hat person usually gets chosen by me. Well, I got balloons, I got, oh, bubbles, yes, bubbles, oh, it's a party, today's Easter, it's a party, it's a party. Oh, and I got my rabbit, oh, man, this is one of my favorite rabbits. I just love it because it kind of reminds me of oatmeal, and he's really, really soft, and his ears are those the best of the best ears of that rabbit. Hmm. Nobody's here to play any games. Hmm. Nobody's here to see my best rabbit ever with the, this oatmeal. Ah! Silly rabbit. Easter is for Jesus. It's about the cross. Oh, that's what it is. I forgot to get to say to remember that. Easter is about Jesus, and it's about the cross. And if we look in our Bible, if we look in the Bible in Luke 24, all this week, we've been talking about, ever since last Sunday, where the prom, when we had our palms, we've been talking about what has happened to Jesus. And some people didn't believe Jesus was really the Son of God. And they thought that he was lying and not telling the truth. And there were some people that did believe, his disciples, his followers. And they crucified him on Good Friday. And then this is what happens on Easter. This is why we get to celebrate. This is why we get to have a party. Woo! Okay, in the Bible, this is part. This is the part we want to celebrate. The Easter Bunny's fine, and my games are fine. Oh, I love the dice and eggs. But this is what Easter is about. In Luke 24, it says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb. Bringing the spices they had prepared, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb where Jesus was. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed, I love that word, perplexed. John Larry probably saying, oh, Tammy used a five dollar word. While they were perplexed, that means they're confused. You know, how did that stone, it's huge, how did it roll away? Suddenly, two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Their clothes were dazzling, they were dazzled. Why are you looking for the living among the dead, asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Who's he? Jesus. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day, Easter. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven disciples and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles the, apostles the things that they had saw. The, the, the stone is rolled away. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. I've had that happen to you. When we stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. cloths. Peter got up and he said, <gasps> he was amazed. What has happened? Well, now we know what's happened, don't we? We know that our Lord, Jesus Christ, went to live with his Father. And that's one of the neatest things to me, is he died, but that's not the end of his life. The best part of life is being able to go and live in heaven with our Lord Jesus and his Son, and I know when my parents passed away that that was one of the best and most treasured blessings I had. I lost my mom, and you know, 11 months later, I lost my father. And I thought, oh man, this is just not a happy thing. But as I reflect on Easter, and I reflect then, reflected then, because I've heard the Easter story for a lot of years, oh, over 60, and I knew that when my mom and dad passed away, that I would get to see them again. 
And I can't wait. First my mom got there and then she said, Dad's on his way. And I know one day that if I do pass away, and when I do, that I will be able to see my mom and dad. I'll be able to see Mr. Bud. I'll be able to see all, lots of friends that we've lost along the way. And I'll get to see some new friends that I haven't even met. But not only has he overcome the grave, he's overcome the sin in our lives. And I think we forget that sometimes. Jesus had to die because God needed him, who was the perfect man, to take away our sins. So today is a day to rejoice, party. Don't forget, hmm, wonder if Tatum or Mr. Bun will get to wear the Easter hat. Because it's still a time to be able to play. And it's still a time to celebrate. Because that's the greatest thing on earth. Is that this life doesn't just end here. It ends when we get ready to go to heaven. And get to be with our Lord. And that's only possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. So rejoice. Praise God. Worship like Brother Tim said. Celebrate. And yeah, don't forget your favorite rabbit. But also remember the reason for the season is Jesus and this cross. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, when we get to Easter Day, when we come to Easter, we realize what happened, what truly, truly happened, that you overcame the grave, you overcame death. And now you're in heaven with our Father, looking out for us and watching us. We are your children, and we want to enjoy this life here on earth with joy and patience and gratitude and all the things you want us to have. But let us not forget the reason for the season is so that we can be with you through your Son because you loved us so much. The only way we could get to heaven was through his blood, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.
And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? And who are you looking for? And she supposed him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you've borne him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself, and she said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them that I ascended to my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to begin this morning by sharing a picture with you. I don't know uh, from the videos if you will be able to fully make this out. I used this picture a few weeks ago as the introduction to the presentation of the word. For those who cannot see, yes, it is a portrait of Jesus, uh, but more than that, it is literally a word picture. It is the entire Gospel of John from in the beginning was the word to the final amen and every word contained in the gospel in between. This treasured gift hangs prominently in my office. It serves as my constant reminder of the primary intent of the fourth gospel. John wants you to see Jesus. That's why he's writing. He gives us a word picture throughout the gospel, inviting us to see Jesus as the Messiah, the promised one from God. And yet even on this side of the cross, John's purpose never wavers. Look again at his version of the first Easter. I'm going to condense this just a little bit, but follow along with me if you can. Mary comes to the tomb while it's still dark. She cannot see, but she saw enough to know that the stone had been rolled away. Fearing the absolute worst, she runs to tell the disciples. Peter and John run to see what Mary saw. Arriving first to the tomb, John looks in. John testifies he saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Peter goes to into the tomb and he sees, and at which time John goes in the tomb and writes, he saw and believed. Then Mary looks into the tomb and sees two angels. She turned and saw Jesus, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus calls her by name. She turns a second time and sees. And it is that experience of sight that allows Mary to exclaim to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. Did you catch it? For John, 
there is a literal visual connection between seeing and believing. It's that connection that John invites us to make. In fact, his entire gospel leading to the cross stands as an open invitation inviting you and I to see Jesus that we might believe in Jesus. But we got a problem. See, in spite of all these efforts to help us to see, sad, sadly, John is now forced to affirm the absolute worst possible news. Jesus is dead. Why did Jesus have to die? That's a good Friday question, isn't it? The answer, the wages of sin is death. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is just no salvation. But don't forget, always add the Easter victory. You've got to add Easter back in there. That's the rest of that verse. Remember how, how Paul continues, he said, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God, right? In recent weeks, much has been made about the necessity to cancel Easter. I want to say this this morning very plainly. No one, absolutely no one can cancel Easter. Easter is not something that was going to happen. Easter is not an event that we were waiting for. Easter is a historical fact. At one time in history, God in the person of Jesus Christ defeated sin, death, and grave for all eternity. Now, we may be forced this morning to adjust some of our Easter traditions. Man, I don't know about you, but I miss that sunrose breakfast. Amen. I'm weeping over the choir's cantata. Uh, some of the traditions that we have celebrated year to year, you know, I, this will be the first Easter that our family hasn't gathered together for an Easter lunch. But even the necessity of social distancing cannot rewrite history, folks. Easter happened. And as such, the resurrection of Jesus Christ now stands as the central theme of all Christianity. Without Easter, there is no salvation. Without Easter, there is no eternal life. Without Easter, we are a people without all. That's the wisdom of the Apostle Paul who wrote, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. But what? Christ is raised. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Amen. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. Granted, this is the truth many celebrate today. It is also the truth many have yet to see. And for this purpose, allow me to insert the eyewitness account of the Apostle John. In our text for the morning, John shares with us two necessary components for anyone to fully see Jesus. Faith and repentance. John expresses the necessity of both as he skillfully merges two stories into one as he recounts the very first Easter. According to John, for anyone to truly see Jesus, 
for one to fully experience Easter either for a first time or even new and refreshed. One must have both. Must, one must experience both. We must have faith coupled with repentance. They go together. So let's start with faith. Faith is the noun to the verb believe. Everybody go, what? Let me try it this way. Faith is what you have when you do believe. Okay? Believe is more than, 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 than thinking something. It's acting on what we know to be true. It is a verb. It's something that you do. You with me? So here, faith is evidence in John's personal testimony. According to John, Mary Magdalene reports the devastating news, and he and Peter immediately go running to the tomb. John arrives first, but finding the stone, just as Mary had said, and John says he stooped down and he peered into the tomb. It was dark, it was empty, but he had enough light that he saw the distorted grave cloths. And at this point, Peter arrives and being uh, uh, very true to his brass nature, Peter goes busting right on in. He too is witness to the grave cloths lying to one side, but more over by itself, neatly folded and carefully placed the sidereon. What's the sidereon? It's the grave net. It's the piece of the grave cloth used to cover the face of the deceased before placing the body in the tomb. So this one's for you, Sue Richardson. You wanted me to share this this morning. I'm going to. In Eastern culture, when one sits at table and one is well fed, uh, he would take the napkin and wipe his mouth and discard it into his plate. And that's a statement to the host as well as the servant who is keeping the table that the meal is great, but I am finished and it's an appreciation. But if by chance, at some point during the meal, that uh, you were called away for whatever purpose might be, the practice was you would take and you would carefully fold the sedarion the napkin, and you would place it beside your plate. And it was a statement to the servant, don't take my plate. Why? I'm coming back. I'm coming again. It's this neatly folded burial napkin, the sudarion, the scriptures refer to when they explain John saw and believed. That's faith, folks. That's the kind of faith necessary for anyone to truly experience Easter. At this point, John had yet to witness the presence of the risen Savior. Yet, he saw the evidence. He accepted the divine promise. And with the folded napkin, Jesus said, I'm coming again. Isn't that neat? I love that. Repentance then is found in Mary's story. Defeated by death, Mary arrives at the tomb. She's filled with sadness and despair. She had, remember, she had come to anoint a dead body. She had come to treat the body to keep it from stinking. So when she discovers the stone rolled away, it only adds to her fear and despair. It only adds to the burdens already weighing her steps. 
Robbed by the sting of death, now Mary faces the additional fear that somehow the body has been stolen away. Not knowing what else to do, she runs and she tells the disciples, they have taken away our Lord, she cries. And Peter and John run to the tomb, she follows. But when they return home, remember the story, Mary remained behind at the tomb, weeping and sobbing. And at some point, I imagine the weight of her tears becomes just overwhelming and eventually she just drops to her knees. And from this humble position, Mary looks up into the sepulcher only to discover two angels sitting where the body of Jesus once lay, seeking to bring comfort to a grieving woman, the angels ask, why are you crying? They've taken away my Lord, she responds, and I don't know where they have laid them. And now at this point, we've got to watch the text very close. Having responded to the angels, Mary now turns, and as she does, she comes face to face with a man she does not recognize, supposing him to be the gardener, the caretaker of the cemetery. A man looks at, uh, looks at Mary and says, why are you weeping and who are you looking for? And she, she thinks he's the caretaker and she says, sir, if you've taken him away. Tell me where you've laid him. Interesting. John records Jesus responding with just one word. Jesus says, Mary. Now at this point, I want you to look at your text. I want you to see this. Mary, according to the text, turns herself. Now, my point I want to make here, if she is standing and looking to the man, and the man says, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And then he says, Mary, and she turns away from the one who's speaking to her? I don't think so. The natural response is someone calls you by name, you look them in the face. You continue the conversation. So what I think is going on here is that John is describing something far more. Instead of a physical turning of the body, I think John is describing a spiritual turning. Now that changes things, doesn't it? After all, that's what repentance is, isn't it? A spiritual turning. Turning, the Greek word is metaneo. It is an action word describing a physical turning away from sin and an intentional turning back toward God. So when we read this scripture as a spiritual turning, we now see what John is trying to say. In, in, in an act of repentance, John says Mary sees beyond what she was previously able to see. Enabling her to identify the master with the 2020 vision. In an act of repentance, Mary sees beyond the death of her friend. And for the very first time, she experiences the miracle of Easter through the eyes of faith and repentance Mary saw the resurrected Lord see that's what it means to experience Easter over time it's become my experience death tends to bind us it tends to blind us it tends to hold us down. Sin tends to leave us defeated and without hope. But when we look to the risen Christ, I promise is sure, God will lift us up beyond both sin and death. 
As our example, Mary saw with spiritual eyes and, and, and believed. It was her personal Easter experience that allows her to testify with great joy. I have seen the Lord. He is risen. And so this Easter, I think we're invited to see Jesus in a new way. Like Mary, we need to learn to see with our heart and not just with our eyes. Like John, we need to trust the evidence we have seen in order to believe that which we have yet to see. And when we do, we can exclaim along with Mary, I have seen the Lord. He has risen. And like John, it could be said of us that we saw and believed. This morning, our invitation invites us to see Easter with a new, possibly a renewed 2020 vision. The truth is, no one can cancel Easter. But to fully experience the miracle, the magnitude of all Easter is, folks, we got to turn from a world and an act of repentance. We got to turn back to the Lord. And see through the eyes of faith. Or let me try it this way. In mathematical terms, faith plus repentance equals a personal Easter experience. Leading us to an eternity with the Father. And that's Easter. An eternal victory won by Jesus Christ. Available to all who are willing to say, Will you join me as we pray? Father, on this Easter morning, we're so thankful for the victory that has been won. It is final, it's not a victory that needs to be redrawn every year, and it's not a, 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 a an event that someone through uh, necessity or whim can just cancel. We thank you that Easter is final. The victory won and now available to all who will see. And so on this day, Lord, we ask you to allow us to see with a renewed vision to understand the necessity of faith and repentance. But most of all, Lord, as we have said, if there is one who is yet to experience Easter for our first time, may this be the day that we come to a new understanding of the price of the cross victory over the grave. For your glory, Lord, draw us to you. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, we pray. Amen.
cheese that they heard. They wondered at the mystery of his word. They wondered what he meant about a father's plan. They heard, but could they really understand?
with our God and with one another. These unprecedented times demand unprecedented action. And for this reason, I've asked each hall to prepare elements to participate in this sacred meal. In addition, I've asked all who join us by video to actively participate in this liturgy and in the sharing of the elements. It's my vision, my prayer, that each home will experience a special stirring as husbands serve their wives, as wives serve their husbands, or maybe as fathers serve their children, or children serve their mom. And in single resident homes, as Christ our host serves you. Remember, a means of grace is only as effective as you allow it to be. And so for every home embracing this moment in reverence, I pray your home will be filled with the presence of God that your heart will be flooded with his comfort. May the grace of our Lord be greater than our social distancing, drawing us together, enabling us to commune as one with our Father and with one another. So now, I invite you to hear these words of invitation from the voice of our Savior who said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And here comes the promise. For they shall be filled. Will you join me in the prayer of great thanksgiving? Father, in this moment, we who are scattered abroad, some by six feet, some in different homes, others in different cities. Nonetheless, with a united spirit, we bow our hearts before you in open praise and a declaration of adoration. We began this Easter morning with a spirit of thanksgiving thanking you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who willingly paid the price of our salvation. Openly we acknowledge a debt he did not owe, one we could not pay. And yet with immense passion, he embraced the cross and welcomed the way of our sin. As we remember the way of the cross, our hearts are heavy, reminded by the finality represented by a sealed tomb. Our tears fall freely, giving evidence to our cries of despair. And yet the good news of the gospel declares in the midst of our most bleak and desperate plight, Easter morning dawned. And through the light of your Son, we now see a vacated cross and an empty tomb. We praise you for the Easter victory, for the eternal truth. Your story, my story, does not end on Golgotha's hill. He who is dead is alive forevermore. Death could not defeat him. The grave could not hold him. And so in remembrance of all your mighty and merciful acts, we now take bread and wine from the gifts that you provide and in an act of obedience we return them to you and with great joy we celebrate together the redemption won for us through Christ Jesus accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living offering of ourselves 
Lord, with these consecrated elements, nourish us with your very nature. Prepare us. Grow us, Lord, both individually and collectively so our lives may faithfully proclaim the one crucified, risen, and now reigns eternally with you. And now with the courage of the children of God, let us pray together in one voice as our Lord taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
for your promised return. And now we hear the charge and the blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, fill your cup to overflowing as together we celebrate this Easter victory and the promise of our eternal home. Amen.